So I think we can just start off. I think Patrick gave a very good introduction there, so no further introduction is needed. Um, just uh, perhaps mention to begin that um, my own interest, how I came to be interested in uh, Markevich, has to do with uh, cataloguing the works in the King's Inns, portraits in the King's Inns, and one of his paintings was there, and I just thought it was unusual and strange that he should be painting a Lord Chief Justice, considering that he was the uh, husband of our uh, famous revolutionary, as it were. I thought the two things didn't match up very well, and I was surprised, so I did a little bit of investigating. Um, the, my main sort of, uh, what I really want, want to talk about tonight is his life as an artist and what he achieved in his own life as an artist. And I won't be talking too much about uh, Constance because I think that's an area that most people know about. Certainly most Irish people know about Constance quite well. Um, so I'm going to try to cover more, uh, concentrate much more on his life. So just to start off with then, he was born in Zhivotovka in this small um, village, but they had a large estate, the family had a very large estate. He was from a noble family and the, uh, he was one of nine children. So although they had a lot of land, they didn't have a huge amount of money, it seems. Um, his son, in a later newspaper article, mentioned that they, they sort of suffered repression after the, uh, the 1863 uh, uh, rebellion, and some of their lands, money, whatever, was confiscated. So they weren't as rich, perhaps, as they would have been in the past. And as I say, there were nine children in the family. Um, so he, he was um, a second son, so he wasn't going to inherit. So he was encouraged you know, from an early age to, to make a career for himself of some sort. So um, initially he went to um, having uh, gone to a gymnasium in uh, Kherson, in his city down on near, the, near the Black Sea on the Dnieper, the, the estuary. Um, he was there for about eight years and then he moved to Kiev. And uh, I'm just showing this particular picture because uh, it shows the actual art college. Well, the art college was um, located in the city hall building, which you can see there um, in the main street in Kiev. And uh, he, he was supposed to be studying law. I mean, he was enrolled in the uh, Kiev University and he was studying law for two years but that was not his interest. He wasn't at all interested in law, but he was interested in art. So he went to the art school at night time, and his teachers were Polish painters there that were working there that were quite famous, that had studied in Paris and in Petersburg. So he had a very good sort of early grounding, if you like, in art at that school. And this is one of his early uh, drawings from about um, 1892 and another early work, which you can see that he was really quite accomplished quite early on, and he had a sort of classical, classical style. He was, would have been initially presumably interested in horses because uh, they bred horses on the, on the estate at Zhivotovka. And just to mention, before I sort of race on, particularly for the sort of Irish people in the audience, that um, Zhivotovka today is in the Ukraine, and it's called Zhivotivka, but at that stage, it was uh, part of the Russian Empire, and that had a sort of a, quite a big bearing on his, his, his future life, the fact that he was actually a Russian citizen, although he was from a Polish family. And then, of course, previous, previous to that, it was part of the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So it, the whole the sort of area he came from had a lot to do with his, um, his personality and his makeup and his later, uh, his later path in life, if you like. So um, he finally managed to, to get away from Kiev and go to Paris. I say finally managed because his parents were very much against this move. They, they were convinced that he needed to be a lawyer and do something uh, that he could make money out of. Uh, but uh, he, he persuaded them that he, uh, to let him go to, uh, let him go to uh, Paris to study art. And uh, they must have provided him with some money because he enrolled in the uh, Academy de Beaux Arts, which he had to pay for, obviously. And that was quite uh, quite a feat to get in there because you had to do a special entrance exam and so on. And it was very popular among 
you know, art students from the whole of Europe wanted to go there, and he managed to get in, so he, he was clearly had talent uh, right at an early stage. And when he arrived in Paris in uh, 1894, he um, immediately sort of uh, rent out an apartment uh, with his girlfriend, who he'd secretly managed to have her come to Paris as well. Um, she had persuaded her parents that she wanted to do music, which she did study music in Paris. Um, but, uh, and then they got married, and very quickly they had two children. They had one child called Stanislav, in 96, 1896, and another one the next year called Richard. And um, at the same time that he, was, uh, he had his family and everything there, he wasn't neglecting his studies. He was doing really very well um, in uh, Paris as a painter. And his works were accepted uh, in all those years. Every year he had work exhibited in the salon, the independent salon in Paris. And this was one of them. Um, this, was one, this particular one um, was exhibited in 98, but prior to that he had uh, a very big painting called Bread. And I mention that pi picture particularly because I have no image of it, I don't know what it looks like, but it's, it's out there somewhere, I presume. Um, it uh, was a very, very large uh, triptych. Uh, with uh, the main scene was um, a big loaf of bread and salt and a, some sort of... Um, uh, tablecloth of some sort in the middle and then on the side panels there were pictures of harvesting and fields and I mean I just have this from a description in a book but this was apparently Constance Markovich's uh, favorite painting and it hung in their house and so you know I would say it went somewhere you know it, it must be out there somewhere in a private collection it'd be just it would be wonderful to sort of to find that but anyway so that was one <coughs> one of his works he also did like this prestigious um, portraits we actually don't know who the figure here is it's just called portrait of a woman and the uh, it's at the moment it's in the um, in the National Gallery in Warsaw and it's the only picture they have by uh, Markevich there um, the just click on to the next one. Um, this is a picture. It's not a brilliant photograph of it, but I suppose this is his most uh, uh, Kazimir Markevich's most famous painting in Ireland because this is of Constance Countess Markevich. Um, but it's when they first met, 1899. They met in Paris, and. As you can see, it's a, it's a lovely romantic uh, painting. It's a full-scale, full full, uh, life-size painting. And today it hangs in Leinster House. And the reason that it hangs there is naturally because of the significance of uh, Constance in our history and so on, and the, her, her part in the fight for Irish independence. But more particularly, it's hanging there because uh, of her significance as a woman um, representative in Parliament. She was the first woman ever to be elected to a Parliament, as far as I know, anywhere. Um, she was elected to the uh, Westminster Parliament in 1918, and she didn't take up her, her uh, post, as it were, because she, being a Sinn Féin member, she uh, was refusing to, um, to uh, make the oath of allegiance to the British crown, so she didn't take up her position there. And then in the next year, she, she was appointed um, Minister for Labour in the first Irish Thal, in the first Irish Parliament. So from those two points of view, she's quite, you know, worldwide famous. The fact that she was a woman and she got, had uh, got to this sort of uh, situation. But anyway, to get back to the painting, uh, the... Um, as I say, they met in, in 99, and they met actually at a student ball. The, uh, they were introduced by a friend of uh, Kazimierz called uh, Krzyzewski, and he um, actually sort of was quite attracted to Constance initially himself, but because she was so tall, apparently she was extremely tall, I mean, above average tall, and so, uh, and also Kazimierz was also extremely tall, and so he thought they'd be better matched, and he sort of introduced them, and then, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But they, this is a picture of 
of them, an actual photograph of the two of them when they first met in that first year that they were uh, friends. And you can see in this particular picture, they're dressed in their um, bicycling outfits. They're both great bicycling um, enthusiasts. And that was quite a sort of a new kind of modern uh, sport, if you like, to be into at that stage. And um, they were very well, very serious about it. Uh, they sort of went on races and things like that. And they even did sort of big, huge marathon cycles across France, like from Paris to Dieppe in a day, this sort of thing. So very sort of adventurous uh, stuff for, for the period that we're talking about. Now, just to say a little bit more about Constance, I'm, I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to concentrate on Constance, but I just want to say a little bit about her at this point, who she was and where she came from and so on that she was from um, a very well-off uh, Anglo-Irish family from Lissadell in County Sligo. Her father was a baronet. Um, they were extremely wealthy, huge amount of land, etc. But she was quite restricted in her upbringing um, because of being a lady from a big house or whatever. She wasn't allowed to do exactly what she wanted to do. And uh, the main hope her family had for her was that she would marry suitably. Um, and basically, by the time she met um, Kashmir's, she was already, she was 30, 31 when she met him. So quite old, really. And the, the parents really have, were beginning to lose all hope that she would ever get married suitably. And um, she had managed to sort of get from under their thumb, if you like, by insisting on uh, studying art. First of all, she went to London to the Slade and studied for a few years, and then eventually she persuaded them to let her go to Paris. But it was a, a sort of an uphill thing. Um, they weren't happy with the idea, and so they were very measly about giving her money. So although she was from a very, very rich family, um, all her friends used to say that they were trying to, the, 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 the Gore Booths were trying to starve her home, you know, to sort of force her back, but she stuck it out. So she had a, she was, had a very sort of gritty personality right from the beginning, you could see this. And of course, so did he, because they both had gone to Paris really against their, um, you know, their respective family's wishes. And maybe just one more thing to say about this particular work is that, oh, it's not a work, it's just a f photograph, but that on the whole point of the fact that they weren't, um, the Gore Booths were not, not only were they not happy that she was in Paris, but they were extremely unhappy when they found out that she wanted to marry Casimir because, uh, well, one, he was a foreigner, which they didn't think much of that. Uh, two, he was a Catholic. They certainly were not happy with that. That was like major not, not happy. And the other third thing, which is probably the most important reason why they weren't happy, was because he was a second son, he wasn't going to inherit any great money himself. So he, from all points of view, from their point of view, he was not suitable. But they did grudgingly um, let, her, let her get married. But before they did, uh, her father died the year, just the year they got married, in fact. But before they did, uh, her brother, who was then sort of in charge of the family, or the head of the family, he had a sort of a say in, in things, you know, would he allow his sister get married to this person or not? And an extraordinary thing came out in recent years. An Irish Times journalist was stationed in Moscow and discovered uh, going through the, um, the Secret Service uh, papers that became, uh, you know, open in, in, in uh, Russia in recent years, discovered that uh, the Gore Booths had actually uh, contacted the, f the, foreign, uh, the Russian foreign minister in Petersburg and asked for him to be investigated. And a sort of an agent, a special agent, Rakowski, was put on his tail, as it were, and followed them for weeks around Paris and uh, furnished a very long and quite interesting um, report on, on, on his character and, you know, was he suitable? Basically, they had asked, is he the sort of person that we would want our friend to be getting married to? And in his report, he, he uh, describes that, well, he was quite unhappy, uh, this agent was quite unhappy by uh, the fact that he was calling himself Count Markevich because of the fact that Count as a <coughs> title isn't particularly well known, or is, isn't really used in Poland. And um, he went, went into a lot of sort of detail as to why, why he shouldn't be calling himself a count. Um, 
the, the, the most likely reason that he called himself Count Markevich, even though his other family members weren't using that title, is that he wanted to signal to people in his immediate uh, grouping in Paris that he was from a noble family, which he was. Um, but anyhow, the, uh, the, the report tells of their daily life, but their daily life, it doesn't really sound like a daily life, they're basically having a great time, it was um, mentioning that they were having parties all the time, there was an awful lot of champagne being drunk, um, there was a lot of gambling going on, and balls and parties, and very strange people turning up at his apartment all the time. Um, what, what did he call them? Uh, people of eccentric e appearance, both male and female. Uh, but it turns out they're just art students and models. So, th and then he ends up the report, which is quite interesting. It's kind of uh, uh, quite touching. He ends up saying, all in all, he's not really a bad sort, and he'll probably be okay when he settles down and grows a little bit older, whatever. So, you know, but it, but it was an interesting insight into their into their life at that time. So, uh, as I said, they got married in, in London, and then they went to Sligo, visit the family. Uh, they were sort of moving between the, 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 the house in the Ukraine and the, her parents' house in Sligo and Paris. They, kept their, uh, they had got a new apartment in Paris, and they continued working there. And uh, Kazimierz's uh, career continued to develop very well. And this painting, I know it looks terrible in its present state. This is just a photocopy from a book. Um, and that's all that we have of this particular picture. It was called Amor, and you could possibly can make out that there's, um, there's a figure of a dead uh, man on the ground, uh, and lying on top of his body is a female figure. And then to the right, we have a sort of a stump of a tree, and growing out of this stump is a sort of a spirit-like character. And this is a picture based on the Polish legend of St. John, which tells of a, um, uh, a rare fern that flourishes or blossoms in the middle of the night uh, uh, once a year. And if you go into the forest um, to, see, to get this uh, rare fern, you can be granted one wish, but only uh, if you show no emotion and no fear. And so the story here is that the young man went into the uh, forest and he wished for love. And then love in the form of a nymph, a beautiful nymph, appeared. And he couldn't contain his emotion. He was so delighted to see her uh, that he immediately was struck dead. And so he's, he's dead here. She's mourning over his, his dead body. And we see this spirit-like character coming from the, uh, from the trees. So it's a very, very much... Um, in tune with the type of painting that was being carried on in Paris at that particular moment. It's very symbolist in style and in the way it's portrayed. Now, obviously, we can't get the full benefit because there's no colour in this picture, but it did make huge waves at the time in Paris. He was awarded, it was uh, accepted for the salon, for the official salon, which was very, very difficult to get into, and it won a gold medal. And he was also um, visited by the, uh, by the Russian Grand Duke, um, Vladimir Alexandrovich, who was um, not only was he sort of the uncle of the Tsar, but he was also the president of the, uh, the Academy of Painting in Petersburg. So this was a huge big deal to have him come to your studio and to, to look at the painting and so on. And he um, arranged that it would be exhibited in Warsaw and in St. Petersburg. So this painting travelled to all these different venues at that time. Uh, and then subsequently, this is the sort of sad bit if you like, subsequently the painting was bought by, um, uh, I think it might have been an, an American lady uh, who was married to an Irishman, uh, Dames Longworth is the name. Um, so I haven't been able to track down the family as such, but she donated it to the Arts Club, to the Arts Club in Dublin. And she arrived at the Arts Club one night and noticed that the painting wasn't hanging. And she sort of said, well, you know, do you not like the painting? Uh, why isn't it hanging? Um, maybe I'll just take it back. And they, they said, yeah, well, okay, if you want, you can take it back. So she took it back, and uh, the other, the, there's another sort of snippet that I found about it that 
apparently she offered it to the um, Polish embassy in London at that time. And this would have been in the 20s, in the 1920s. So anyhow, it's, it's lost at the moment. So if anybody ever comes across it or hears about it, I'd love to, I'd love to know about it. So anyway, uh, this is just a picture of um, Constance's, Constance Gorbuth's house in Sligo. This is called Lissadell, and all the Irish people here will know well that it's Lissadell, but um, at the moment it's actually going through a sort of a controversial patch because uh, it was bought from the family um, only a few years ago, about five years ago, it was bought from the Gorbuth, they sold up eventually. And a um, private couple purchased the house and did wonderful work. They've done it up. They've uh, bought sort of paintings and everything to go with it. And they've done the grounds and really re sort of restored it to, to its original uh, status. Um, but just uh, at Christmas, there was a big to-do with the county council uh, about right-of-way. And so they decided, you know, okay, if you're going to force us to have some right of way going through the place, we're going to close it. And that's what they've done. They've closed the, the, the house to the public. So it's really pretty, pretty disastrous. And now it's all going to the High Court. So we don't know what's, what the next thing will be. So um, moving on then in the sort of the family life of uh, Kazimierz Markiewicz, uh, he, I don't know, maybe I missed out, maybe I forgot to tell you that his first wife died, <laughs> didn't mention this, that his first wife died. Um, she died in 1899 and so did the, um, so did the second son, the, 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 the younger son. And so he was just left with one son, which is Stanislav, and he is in this picture here. So this is Constance Stanislav, and this is uh, their only daughter, which was Maeve. And she was born in 1901 in, in Lissadell. She was born in Lissadell and she was actually left in Lissadell with the grandmother while they pursued their artistic life in Paris and Ukraine, wherever they were, all, all the different places that they went to. And I just thought I'd show that because it sort of shows this sort of idyllic family life um, that might have been, but actually it didn't in fact last like that. Um, now just to get on to the paintings that uh, uh, Markevich did in Ireland, there's, I have very few to show you, just whatever I have, most of it is um, copied out of books from the period, art per periodicals and so on of that time. Um, but we do know from various records that uh, right when, he, when the two of them came back finally to settle in Ireland, they came back in uh, 1903 to, to actually settle in Ireland, the um, uh, Mrs. Gorbuth or Lady Gorbuth, she bought them a, a, a house in Rathmines as a sort of a wedding present um, and that was uh, Frankfurt House um, and they immediately started uh, organising exhibitions, painting exhibitions, the two of them because of course Constance was also a painter. And uh, so in 1903 and 1904, they had very, very big exhibitions in Dublin. In, in the first one, he showed 20 pictures, and in the second one, he showed 80 pictures. So, you know, uh, there's a huge body of work. Now, they're all disappeared, those paintings. They're out there somewhere. I don't know where they are. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, gives you some idea. This, uh, the second exhibition was called um, Paintings from Two Countries. And so the two countries in question were Ireland and the Ukraine. And uh, the, this one is Evening in Ireland, and this one is called Russian Cottage. Uh, this one actually does exist in the sense that, I mean, we know where it is. This is in, the, in Cork, in the Crawford Gallery in Cork. And this one is in the Municipal Gallery. Um, the Municipal have about four or five paintings by uh, Kazimierz. This one is slightly more sort of symbolist. And you can see just in those three pictures that I've shown you, there's quite a divergence in style. So he had a facility. He was really able to turn his hand to any style that he wanted to. And he wasn't coming down strongly in, one, in favor of one or another at this early point. He was skipping from sort of more symbolist to more uh, ex uh, impressionist style pictures and even to very kind of uh, realistic type painting, ac academic style painting. So we see all of those different styles emerging in his work. 
And this is, from my point of view, uh, one of the most interesting works he did. It's a portrait of George Russell, A.E., um, who was a very, very influential figure in the whole uh, Celtic revival uh, in Ireland. He was a poet, a mystic poet, and he uh, was the first person to befriend Casimir in Ireland. Uh, when he found that they were coming to live in Rathmines, where he also lived, he got very excited and s sort of saw them as being, the two of them being a huge sort of um, addition to the cultural, cultural life of Dublin. And they had a huge influence on him, particularly uh, Casimir, because he uh, d encouraged him to paint. I mean, he was a poet and a writer, but he had never thought of painting. But uh, uh, Kashmir's insisted that he try and encouraged him and so on. And the result is very interesting because, for instance, here, this is an example of uh, Russell's own work. And as you can see, it's very, uh, very mystic and so on. He, uh, his, his interest, he was very interested in things uh, spiritual and in this, the spirit life, if you like. And this particular picture is called... Um, plow and the spirit so you can see a plow man here in the foreground and then the spirit in the background and the um uh, he was also interested not just in clairvoyance and spirituality and so on but he, his his actual day job uh, george russell's day job was working for the cooperative movement agricultural cooperative movement so there's a sort of a link it all links up in his paintings in fact oops well just to show you that they're very similar that those two styles of painting. This particular work is uh, a portrait painting by uh, Kazimierz uh, and it dates to about 1906 and it's of a, another very good friend of his and you can see again that the style has changed again that uh, the last picture that we were looking at of George Russell was much more painterly, much more free and so on and this is more sort of a cl more clipped style, more um, uh, more academic in its, uh, um, in its manner. And so he did have this aspect to him that he changed his style quite frequently. But she's an interesting person because she was also very prominent in Irish um, uh, cultural life. She was a patron and she was the first uh, curator of the Hugh Lane Gallery, the municipal gallery as we know it today. Um, and they, she, he, uh, Kashmir and Constance and Ellen Duncan, which was her name, and George Russell, they all got together and formed a, an arts club called the Dublin Arts Club, which still runs today, still exists today. And they were also very uh, prominent in organising the Municipal Gallery because Hugh Lane was in, uh, at that particular point in time was trying to organise a modern gallery in Ireland and they were all involved in that and helping out. Oh, so this one is interesting. This is, uh, it's not by Kashmir, it's by Lady Glenavy, mm -hmm. who was a member of that arts club that I mentioned. And this is a caricature showing the early days of the arts club and it's, it's, it's showing what it looked like in 1910. And I'm showing it to you primarily to give you an idea of the general kind of view people had of Kazimierz Markevich at that stage. This is him here in the, in the centre, this very large figure. And uh, the, the caption reads, in the good old days before the licence, members arriving for a house dinner. So the thing was, as they didn't have a licence, people had to bring their own uh, refreshments with them. And Kazimierz is shown here at the door with a gun in his hand, refusing entry to people that didn't have the bottle, the required bottle with them. So one, he was obviously considered um, a bit of a, uh, a bon viveur and he was clearly sort of um, interested, he liked having a, a good social life as well as uh, being interested in, in, in culture. And the other thing of course is his size, his huge size, he was towering above uh, other people and this is, you know, it's a typical perception of what he was like. And this is another one. Again, he's a bit more subdued in this one, in the background there. But it gives you a flavour of the arts club at the time, which is very interesting because here, for instance, in the foreground, we have um, William Orpen, the very famous uh, portrait painter. And uh, he had be become a member and he was uh, apparently uh, asked to do a, a sort of a group portrait of the people in the, in the club. 
and you have all these different sort of uh, competing characters. They weren't all artists. Some of them, for instance, of a famous uh, alpinist there climbing the side of the wall in, on the far left. Um, you have um, William Butler Yeats on the extreme right uh, uh, sh sh giving a verse or something like that. And that's another interesting thing. Um, Kashmir was, of course, uh, knew William Butler Yeats very well. Uh, Yeats was a great friend of, uh, of Russell. And so they would have been at parties because George Russell would have these sort of um, uh, salons in his house every week and all the sort of literary people would come. And so they knew each other well, but um, Yeats and Kashmir, they didn't get on at all well. And there's quite a lot of, in the various biographies, you come across that quite a bit. And I'll tell you more about it in a minute as to why they didn't get on so well. But um, so apart from the sort of artistic life and all the various cultural people they were meeting, they also had um, uh, a different social life, which was uh, based on or centred upon the Viceregal Lodge and Dublin Castle. And this is a picture of the two of them, of Constance and Kashmir, uh, before a ball, a fancy dress ball in 1905. And they're all in their, you know, the best gear or whatever and getting ready. And it just shows you uh, sort of another aspect to them, that they were part of a different society, if you like, the upper echelons of Dublin uh, uh, society. And if we just continue now, this is the picture that Patrick mentioned, that you were mentioning earlier on, uh, the investiture. Um, as Patrick mentioned, it is... A picture, a, a very, a, quite an awkward picture in that it's a group painting. It's a difficult thing to achieve to, to include so many people in one, uh, in one image. But obviously it was a great commission that he got. Uh, Kashmir got this commission from the Lord Chief, uh, the, the Lord Lieutenant rather, who was the sort of Viceroy in Ireland. And you can see him sitting in the centre of the picture. Um, and it was this investiture for the... Uh, the um, Earl of Mayo, he was be being made a knight of St. Patrick. And as uh, Patrick here mentioned, the interesting thing is that we see, sorry if I don't want to, here, this is Constance here, sitting in the audience. But even more extraordinary, the fact, I mean, it's not really extraordinary that she's there because that's her set, that's her, her group, if you like. Uh, she was related to several of the, of the great lords that were sitting around the table. Um, so there was nothing unusual that she should be there. But there's something very ironic that we also see the Prince of Wales, just here, the little fe the fellow with the moustache in the corner there. That was the Prince of Wales. This one, this painting dates to 1905. And the Prince of Wales was made, was crowned King George V in 1910. And Constance was first arrested for protesting about uh, George V and when he visited Ireland, she protested, she was arrested, etc., etc. And it just seems incredibly ironic that only a few years earlier, less than five years earlier, there they all were sitting at this wonderful evening, you know, uh, event, which was a big deal. This was a very big deal at the time. This is, uh, this is the portrait from the King's Inn that I mentioned earlier, and it's of the Lord Chief Justice at the time, which was uh, uh, Peter O'Brien, uh, Lord Kilfenora. And he was also, in fact, a neighbour in Rathmines, and he was, they were a frequent guest, guests at his house. 